Previously, on years of living dangerously. 20% of all the emissions now come from deforestation. Increasing rates of loss is Indonesia. They're clear for two products, palm oil and paper. It's pretty much on every aisle of most supermarkets. Candy bars, cookies, cheese its It's not the oil that's bad, it's how the oil is produced. One of the big source of corruption is actually the forestry sector. This is horrifying. Right. Wow. Oh, I can't wait to see the Minister of Forestry. I can't wait. When I was governor of California, I watched over 5 million acres of forest in my state burn. The blazes seem to be getting bigger and bigger, and fire season seem to last all year. Now, what about the behavior of the fire? And what, what have you noticed in as far as changes are concerned? Because it seems to me a lot of people now are talking about the fire season is longer, the fires are more intense. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what, what changes have you seen? I started fighting fires in 87. I like to look at an example of the dude fire, and I think that was like 20,000 acres. And I, you know, it blew our minds at that time being a very large fire. And nowadays, you know, we're seeing some 400,000 acre fires. So, yeah, so do you think, how much do you think has to do with uh, global warming? You can't deny the fact that it's getting warmer and drier. And, and we're seeing it in the effects of the wildland fires. I've seen the aftermath of plenty of wildfires, but I've never had a chance to see what it is like to fight these mega fires on the ground until now. I'm in Indonesia to more fully understand the deforestation that's going on here. It's an urgent issue because destroying forests emits about the same amount of greenhouse gases as the world's entire transportation sector. And I'm learning that deforestation has other victims. Once you've seen them sitting behind bars like this, it sort of brings the reality home. I hear you, man. <laughs> are changing the atmosphere in unexpected and in unprecedented ways. That the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. The atmosphere and ocean have warmed. The amounts of snow and ice have diminished. Sea level has risen and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have... There is no more fire season. We have wildfires all year round. Climate change, extreme weather. Call it what you will, and our vulnerability to it. With 12 years of drought, 
has left the landscape bone dry. We got any patriots in the crowd? A new scientific report has determined the last decade was the warmest on record. Our world is changing faster and more dramatically than ever before. People often ask me why a Republican like me cares about climate change, but it's not about politics. When I first became governor of California, climate change wasn't really one of my priorities. So when fire season started, my focus was on grieving families and rebuilding. Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger visited with evacuees and praised firefighters for their work. I and my movies played heroes, but those firefighters are true heroes. But as I watched California experience the worst wildfires ever recorded, I started to wonder what was happening. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. And now since I'm out of office, I have made it my mission to find out what role climate change plays in these fires. If we do nothing, we are on track for a temperature increase of 3.6 to 5.3 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. We have seen in California already the changes. There is no more fire season. We have wildfires all year round. I also want to understand what this all means for the men and women who risk everything to fight these fires. I want to go right up to the fire line and see it through their eyes. This year, a team of elite firefighters gave me that chance. My name is Randy Anderson. I've been a hotshot for 24 years. The definition of a hotshot crew is a full-time fire suppression crew of, of 20 to 25. You ready? Our specialty is uh, going to the rougher terrain. 3841, 3842, 3843. Where engines can't easily access. The Snake River Hotshots out of Idaho are one of the 100 plus elite firefighting teams that were created by the federal government to act as the last line of defense between ordinary people and massive wildfires. You guys are not in a great spot right now. I tried to head down drainage as fast as I could. I'm sure you can see Shit. that. Let's go, following me towards the metal. Let's go, move it. Getting ready for fire season means intense physical training. By the time the season starts, the hard shots will be back in peak condition, ready again to battle enormous wildland places and ready to protect themselves if something goes wrong. Deploy, deploy shelters now! Move it, move it, move it, let's go! But if this fire season is anything like last season, one of the worst in history, hot shots will again be put to the test. Fires running wild, threatening hundreds of homes. Get out, guys, go! Plumes can now be seen from space. This year's 32,000 wildfires around the country have burned an area the size of Connecticut. The U.S. Forest Service says its billion-dollar firefighting budget is nearly tapped out, and it's diverting money from other areas to make up the difference. More than 9 million acres across America burned that year. And now the hotshots are bracing for another brutal season. If you have been or plan to be involved in wildland firefighting, it is important to understand the fire behavior history of the area you fight fire in. Right before they deploy, the hotshots are reminded that fighting fires is no game. In the past 20 years, more than 350 wildland firefighters have died in the line of duty. Those people are not stupid. Something's happening with that fire behavior that for some reason they're not anticipating. And then it happens and they get caught. I don't think scary is the right word. Dangerous, definitely. Well, yeah, you gotta be scared. You know, you gotta be, you gotta respect fire. Fire moved about five or 600 acres an hour. Today's winds are supposed to be predicted even higher. 460 total homes evacuated at this time. 
When we're done by the close of business today, I'd estimate we'll probably have 600 firefighters on the ground. They're working 24 hours a day. They're two shifts, a day shift and a night shift. It's late July, and I'm joining the Snake River hotshots as they deploy to Montana. There's a wildfire in the mountains headed straight for the town of Superior. You got some tough work ahead of you. Keep your head in the game, listen to your division soups, listen to your leaders, have your plan in place, and be ready for the unexpected. I'm amazed at how many people it takes to fight a 21st century fire. This camp I'm toward has almost 1,000 people. Cooks, maintenance workers, local firefighters, helitech pilots, and hotshots. Hey guys, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Good to see you. How's it going? Hey, I hope you have a good driver. <laughs> okay, good. What cars are you guys using? What is it? A ram? Yeah. yeah. And do they have any protection, fire protection, or did they build any, any special? No, huh? So you just keep it out of the flames. You keep it out of the flames. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 10 mile ride to the fire, which gives me a chance to ask these guys how they feel about the fire season. From this platform, we're ready to be out on assignment for two weeks at a time. Right. We only need two weeks at a time? Yeah. All right, must take a real toll on the family. Yeah. I mean, because there's not many people that will put up with that. Yeah. You know, and say, bye. Yeah. i see you in 14 days, or i see you in a month, yeah. or whatever it may be. It's definitely something that takes a while to get used to, being on the road and being away from family and friends. And yeah. There's definitely a sacrifice to it. And then when the fire season is over, then what do you do after that? In this particular season, I'm gonna go get married. Afterwards. So, yep, yep. Got it. directly following the season, uh, getting married in the backyard of my house. I live in a small town on the west side of the Tetons. That's great. Another guy tells me about his new baby at home that he has barely seen. I realize everyone here has something on the line. Before long, the smoke is so thick it blocks out the sun, and it's hard to think about anything but the fire that awaits us. How many animals are on the island? We've got 50 at the moment. Lona Drusher Nielsen founded this refuge 15 years ago. Since then, more than a thousand orangutans have come here because the forests where they lived were burned to the ground to make room for palm oil and other industries. She has a two-year-old baby. Oh, you see the baby is with her? Oh, look at that baby. Wow. Now they have nowhere else to go. The very small babies, they actually used to stay in my house. I had up to like 36 babies um, oh, really? in my house, yes. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Milani. Milani. Hey, Milani. Hi. Do you want my hat? Oh. That's an orangutan greeting. Just oh. taking your hand and sniff it. When you look in those eyes, it's like they take you somewhere. I think she might have fallen in love. <laughs> <laughs> Every single orangutan that has come into the center, the mothers has been killed. Who killed the mothers? The palm oil industry used to pay. We don't have any proof that they're still doing this, but when they, they started opening up back in 2002, 3, 4, they were paying awards to the local people for killing orangutans. You know, you can't just turn them away and throw them out, can you? 
First we took the home away, and then they killed the mothers. And we then got just going to say, no, they're not worth it. This is the forest fires. During June, uh, there were almost 10,000 hotspots in only one month. I'm seeing the extent of the destruction at a 200,000-acre national park called Teso Nilo. It's supposed to be protected, but that hasn't stopped palm oil interests from invading the park, torching it, and setting up their plantations in the ashes. And apparently, there's big money behind it. To establish an oil palm plantation, we calculate that you need $5 million what? to do so. Wow. Right? Well, you don't invest $5 million in something unless it's a lead pipe cinch that it's mm -hmm. going to, that it, that you're going to get away with it. So you, there must be some protection at a higher level. Yeah. Some strong politicians in this province or in the district as well mm -hmm. are behind this. So they're pretty confident that there's not going to be any enforcement or any kind of punishment for what they've done. Oh, man. Two members of local parliaments are being investigated for ownership of plantations inside the park. And it's bigger than that. A company called Wilmar, which trades almost half the world's palm oil, has a mill near the park and had been buying from the illegal plantations. Wilmar supplies everyone from Nabisco to Gillette, so there's even a chance that some Tessanilo palm oil has made its way to your local supermarket. It's been two years since the president here declared a moratorium on deforestation, and it's obviously being ignored. Driving through one patch of burned out forest after another, I'm more and more outraged. These trees used to store vast amounts of carbon, but now all that carbon is in the atmosphere, warming the planet even more. Back at Tessa Nilo National Park, I'm joined by Kunturo Manku Subroto, Indonesia's top official in charge of combating deforestation and corruption. This is a national park. This is a, supposed to be a, controlled by the government, right? How, how does that make you feel? I mean... Very sad. Watching this happening here in front of our eyes makes very sad. Ventura wishes he could do more to stop what's happening, but despite his impressive title, he doesn't have the power to enforce the law. We're told that there are hundreds of, of illegal operations. Why isn't it being stopped? Corruption is the real enemy of, the, of, of a good system. You issue an illegal license, you permit them to operate like that, you don't have any environmental Wait, analysis. You just said something that I didn't understand. You said you issue them an illegal license. They can give a, a license to somebody in violation of the rules? Some of them have license, some of them they don't have license. Right. Those who have license, sometimes their license is overlapped with another license. So that's illegal. But the Minister of Forestry was here. He came in a <laughs> helicopter and he met people and he saw what was happening here. Didn't he have the power or the authority to well, stop what was happening? He has the power to stop it. He does the power to stop it. Well, he didn't. But he didn't. it's just a matter of how do you exercise that power. As we approach the fire, I can feel the tension rise. The hard shots tell me that you never know what kind of a fire you will be fighting until you get there. Okay, uh, my squad starting uh, yeah. On a typical fire, one of the first things we'll do is walk around it, you know, and evaluate it first for safety and make sure it's safe to bring people in. You guys will be along the trail? And then we'll come up with yeah. a plan on how we're gonna suppress the fire. We're gonna prep this road and then possibly burn this out today. See how that goes. 
it's a dangerous environment. You can get someone struck by lightning or hit by a tree or have a rolling rock come and take somebody out. Stay heads up. Still a lot of snags. Possible distractions around us. Don't let it get to you. Business as usual. Get this wrapped up and move on to the next one. Do you have any questions? Or... What about branches falling down? Yep. Uh, Widowmakers, anything like that. So make what do you sure call it? overhead. Widowmakers? Yeah, Widowmakers are basically sticks up in the air. Anything that could fall and potentially you know, hurt kill or kill someone. Yeah. You know, our main goal, as with all fire crews, is initial attack and trying to keep them small. But usually you'll get to the back of one of these root holes and end up finding heat. So what you do, the back of the hand's more sensitive than the palm. So pull your glove and just use the back of your hand to feel for the heat. So there's a lot of heat in this one. So if you can take the heat out of it or the oxygen, it's going to help your cause there. By the third day, the fire is only 20% contained. And then the heat wave of high 90 degree weather creates the perfect condition for it to spread. And it does, down the mountain towards Main Street, Siberia. Flat Creek Road outside the city limits remains closed and under mandatory evacuation. For hundreds of evacuated homeowners, the only hope is that the hot shots can stop the flames before they burn through the town. This palm oil plantation is owned by Frankie Wajaya, one of Indonesia's richest men. How many acres do you have here? In this area, we have about 50,000 hectares. He's the king of palm oil in a land where palm oil is king. Indonesia exports more of the stuff than any other country on the planet. But you have other plantations around the country. Yes, totally we have about 450,000 hectares. Wow, it's huge. Very big, yes. That's well over a million acres. What used to be here before it was palm oil? Long, long time ago, suddenly it's just always for us. Maybe not that long ago. In the 1960s, forests covered more than 80% of the country. Now, almost half of that is gone. For years, the government encouraged deforestation by taking land from indigenous people and licensing it to companies like Sinar Mas, the conglomerate owned by the Wajayas. They made billions in the process. But in the last few years, Frankie Wajaya has turned over a new leaf. He's pledged to stop destroying forests. Environmental sustainability and economic opportunity is something that can be coexist together. And that's why he's agreed to show me his operation. How many times does a tree get harvested? Three times in Three a month. Three times in a month? In a month. Wow. A lot of manual work. Yeah. This bunch is about 20, 22 kilos. Right. And then there's a lot of fruitlets. So the, these are the things that need to be picked up. That's the profit. That's the profit. Palm oil has made a huge contribution to the economy of Indonesia. But there's also a flip side, right? Yes. There's been a lot of environmental destruction. Yes. And particularly deforestation, which has contributed to greenhouse gas emissions. And some of the wealthiest people in this country were responsible for the most damage. I 
may want to disagree for that. Because for those big industry or big corporation, certainly they want to be sustainable. They now they do. Be. Now they do. Yes. Did they in the past? Wasn't there an endless supply of forests in their minds or in the minds of the government? And that the, that it was important to get as much income out of that area? And didn't the, the forest suffer? And didn't your family get enriched? And other rich people in this country, hardworking people, but rich people, do you ever feel guilty about that? At that time, the government said, this is OK. You can do this. I know that. So I'm asking you now. Even before the government uh, announced for non-burning, we already announced ourselves two, three years earlier. So Frankie, no, you're, yes. you're an enlightened man. Yes. You know the science. You know business. You have a sense of social responsibility. But still, I'm asking the question, do you feel guilty at all? If you know and you do it, then you feel guilty. If you do right. not know and you do it, and you correct it when you know it, then you don't have to feel guilty. But Frankie didn't just change out of the goodness of his heart. That's only part of the story. He cleaned up his act after Greenpeace targeted him and his company, Sinar Mas, and got some of the world's biggest corporations to stop buying from him. Bustar. Harrison. How are you? I'm good, man. Bustar Maitar led this Greenpeace campaign and many others and made a lot of enemies along the way. You've had threats against your own personal safety, haven't you? <laughs> yes. I, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, do yes. you take that seriously? I take seriously, but I'm not taking that personally. You know, <laughs> because if, if I take that personally, it's become personal to personal, you know? Yeah, yeah. You recently entered into an agreement with perhaps the largest family-owned conglomerate here, who are the major producers of palm oil, the Wajaya family. Sinarmas. Sinarmas. You were instrumental in persuading them to make changes in their policy, yeah. right? Yeah. After almost three and a half years campaign, blocking the tanker of the palm oil in the biggest palm oil port in Indonesia, we get the attention from them. So you dealt directly with Frankie Wijaya, Yeah, right? I met with uh, Frankie Wijaya a couple of times. As a human being, yeah. I think he has heart also to, yeah. to, to protecting our forest. Of course, also, as a, he's the businessman, he's talking a lot about the, the employment, the economic growth, and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. But in the end, government is the one who should managing this. Do you think that the Minister of Forestry is really committed to the policy of deforestation? I can see his heart. I, I talk to him quite a lot. Right. But in Indonesia, also, is a lot of politics going on. Right. Corruption, lack of the governance, so, in terms of talking, he is saying a lot of things good, but in terms of action, it's far away. It seems like the government itself is a big part of the problem. I have a meeting with the forestry minister. I have a lot of questions. Flames racing towards Superior, the Hardshots decided that a backfire is the best chance for saving the town. It means fighting fire with fire. You're burning the fuels in advance of the fire. So when the fire gets to it, it's going to run out of fuels. Plan is start burning using the crews, the drip torches held by hand. Very nice work. The plan works. The backfire cuts off the path of the fire. No homes are seriously damaged, and no one in the town of Superior is hurt. Back in camp, I breathe a sigh of relief until I remember that this is only one firefight in a long season. But as the hardshots prepare for the fire still ahead, I learn that in another forest, scientists are looking back into the past, trying to understand how fires are changing. 
Dr. Tom Swetnam has spent the last 30 years studying the link between global warming and fire. This is actually his second career. He used to be a hotshot. There's one there. So let's cut it and take a look. I've been around forest and fire all my life, and uh, I appreciate fire as really a beautiful thing. But then I can see the other side of it. It can, it can be good and it can be bad. And this place, it's done bad, I'm afraid. Swetnam looks for clues buried deep inside the trees. Okay, all right, so this is the moment of truth. Each ring is a year in the tree's life and each captures an entire year of climate history. When the tree was a young tree, small tree, it has fire that kills it right there, and then it grows around, the rings grow around till the next fire here. Over the course of his career, Swetnam has gathered the largest tree ring collection in the world, over two million of them, with samples going back 3,000 years. It becomes hard down to the level of an individual fire to say that big fire was caused because of climate change. But when you start looking over the really big areas like the whole of Western United States or all of Canada or Russia, and you see that the temperature trends are in the same way in all of the places and that they're closely coupled, the smoking gun is basically there. So getting hotter, getting drier, and the fires are just going right up along with that. Swetnam says that because of global warming, Mountain snow now melts earlier each year. And when that happens, the ground dries up earlier too, leading to worse and worse fire conditions. The end result, the day's fire season is now two and a half months longer than it was just a few decades ago. And with that, the number of acres burned has shut up. On average, fires are six times more destructive today. It can all be seen in the tree rings. No one remembers in living memory of, of people living today of the kind of scale and ferocity of the fires that we're seeing in, in these landscapes. All right. Let's go find some more. And Swetnam discovered something else that I think is even more shocking. The day's fires are so big and so hot that they burn through the soil. And when that happens, the soil more easily erodes. In this near apocalyptic environment, it can take trees up to a thousand years to grow back. This is outside of the norm. This is catastrophic. Finally, I'm meeting the forestry minister. I have a lot of questions. What's blocking the effort to save that peat forest? The lease of the land from the okay. government. It's not being being granted. Why? The minister of forestry have to sign this concession right. Why is Tessa Nilo almost gone? What about the corruption, the devastation, the complete lack of enforcement? Minister, thank you for taking the time with us. We've been traveling around your country for the past couple of weeks. We have some questions. In the last 15 years, 80% of the forest has been commercially exploited. And when you ask many Indonesians why this has taken place, they say, sir, that there's too strong a connection between business and politics in this country. Uh, yang lain, uh, anda tahu kita baru berdemokrasi. Uh, tapi saya yakin kita dalam waktu yang panjang mungkin akan 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 apa namanya terjadi titik yang seimbang. One project to preserve a, a peatland forest has been seeking approval for many years. The last step in the process is your signature, sir. Will you sign the paper that will allow them to preserve this critical natural resource? 
Saya kalau tidak salah, baru separuh yang disetujui, kira-kira 100 ribu hektar. You are willing to sign Harat, yeah. the paper yeah. 50%. to give them 50% of yeah. what they're asking for. Mm-hmm. When will that happen? Kalau mereka setuju, saya kira har- lusa minggu depan sudah bisa. We were in Tessanilo. Mm. Tessanilo. <laughs> National Park. Okay. It's not funny. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. not funny. Yeah. Only mm. 18% of it remains. Mm. We saw it. There are new roads, new illegal roads. Forests cut, trees laying on the ground, burnt where they fell. It's devastating, it's heartbreaking to see it. You saw it. You pledged a resolution. What have you done? I baru lihat terkait kaget. Kami tiap hari untuk mencoba menyelesaikan persoalan. Kami baru mengalami apa yang disebut demokrasi. Sir, they didn't Kamu drop ke... out of the sky on this property. They came there over a period of time and there was plenty of time to stop the behavior, stop the activity. Tadi saya sudah jelaskan, ini bukan Amerika memang berbeda. Kami baru mengalami apa yang disebut dengan reformasi. Ya, baru ini. Sekarang orang baru bebas. Baru bebas kadang-kadang kami memang surplus apa yang disebut dengan surplus demokrasi. Oleh karena itu kami sekarang buat program untuk mencoba so memindahkan mereka, yeah, okay. mencari lahan pengganti nama. I understand. Yeah. You're willing to lose the battle. Mm. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Okay. All right. I see all of this wealth, but it's at the top of the heap. Uh-huh. Down at the bottom of the heap, sir, there's inequity, yeah. there's illegality, mm-hmm. and there's corruption. Mm. Thank you for your time. Sama-sama. Terima kasih. Such a staggering number, people wondered if what they were hearing was correct. 19 firefighters dead, all of them gone as a result of a single fire in Arizona. The men were trying to help get the blaze under control when the fire suddenly shifted, taking them by surprise. These are the final images of the Granite Mountain hotshots, taken less than one hour before they perished. It was the worst tragedy in the history of the hotshots. A fire raced across Yarnell Hill and engulfed the team, killing 19 out of 20 members. Tonight, we want to pray for those firefighters who are still on the lines tonight. The wildfires have been continually escalating. And I think we're going to have to ask ourselves Uh, a set of broader questions about uh, how we're handling increasingly deadly and difficult fire fights. News of the tragedy made its way to fire camps everywhere. For the Snake River hotshots, a dark cloud would hang over the remainder of the 2013 fire season. But in the heat of the summer, the fire season continued on unrelenting, with more fires than hotshots to fight them. And fires that used to be harmless are now life-threatening, because people have built towns and homes deeper in the woods than ever before. 19,000 firefighters are fighting 50 major fires. Wildfires exploding overnight in the Rocky Mountains. Conditions are hot. Dry. This has been a deadly year for people who fight wildfires. Large wildfires burning in 11 states, including six major fires in Montana. There's fires all over Idaho. There's fires in Northern Cal. There's fires in Montana. It's a lot of urgency. Now let me ask you guys, has your mother never taught you to wash your hands before you have lunch? <laughs> no? She tried, it didn't stick. Yeah. This job ruined that real quick. I have a question. So, I mean, bodybuilder, Hollywood icon, governor. I mean, what's, what's next 
for you personally, gold one. Hot shots is all that's left. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, the movie business is a fun business to be in. But you have to have patience. Like, I remember when we did Terminator, and I had to say, I'll be back. Right? It became a famous line. But we did, like, 20 different takes, 20 different ways. And I would argue with the director. I said, no, I think it's better if I say, I will be back. And Jim Cameron said, uh, no, leave me, let, let me do the writing, and you do the acting. <laughs> I played a firefighter in one movie. So I, I always had a great respect for firefighters. And I think that someone is willing to risk their lives to save someone else's. That's a, that's a, a very interesting mentality. You know, like my father was a police officer and uh, my mother was worried always um, because it was a dangerous job. So how do your families feel about that, about what you do? your wives, your mothers, siblings. I think my wife's pretty good with it, but I'm sure there's times that she worries. Yeah. I call her, I let her know what fire we're going to. I try as best I can if we're gonna be spiking out and not be able to talk for days. But I'm sure she worries sometimes. Oh, I bet, yeah. What about you? Um, I think most of us don't really view the job as very dangerous. Um, I like to say it's hazardous. I mean, we work in an environment where there are falling trees and rolling rocks, things like that. But, you know, I don't really think of myself as putting my life on the line every day. You know, I think you have to feel the way you do, you know, not to go out every morning and say, oh my God, I never see my family again and all these this things. But I think the fact is that it can happen. Just recently, 19 hot shots uh, probably felt the same way. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I never thought I'd see anything where an entire hotshot crew would get wiped out. Never thought in my lifetime we would see that. So it it brings, you know, brings you back to this could happen to me or to my crew. Fires are the most well-known threat to forests. They put people's lives and homes at risk. But then they learn of an even greater threat to the long-term survival of trees. A threat made worse by global warming and a threat that has long obsessed Diana Six. When I go up into the high elevations and I see just seas of red and gray now where these amazing stands of these trees used to be, I don't just see dead trees like a lot of people when they go up there and think, oh, this forest will just grow back, it's, it's normal, because I know it's not. I know better. This is a complete ecosystem shift, and this is pretty devastating. And the killer, it turns out, is smaller than a fingernail. Menurut Menhut Harrison Ford, aktor Hollywood Harrison Ford, aktor Hollywood Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford. Years of living dangerously. The day after my interview, the forestry minister is telling the media, I didn't show him enough respect. <laughs> Maybe he's right. He's threatening to have me deported. It's all over the news. Today, I'm supposed to meet with the president to find out how he feels about the devastation of his country's forests. And with all the controversy, the media glare now waiting for us is intense. You've created a moratorium on exploiting natural forest. Is it being respected? Tentu ada yang menentang, ada yang tidak suka dengan moratorium policy, tapi bagi saya harus karena banyak yang bisa dilakukan tanpa merusak lahan gambut. One of the unfortunate things we've seen is disregard of the law. For instance, in Tessa Nilo, only 18% sir, of the park remains. You're aware of this. Mr. President, in conversation with the uh, forestry minister yesterday, um, I asked him about the respect for the law. 
and why it was that there was so much illegal activity. Isn't there an enforcement effort that can help at least set an example? Tentu saya tidak selalu tahu apa yang terjadi di setiap jengkal di Indonesia ini. Saya mendengarnya pun tidak happy kejadian seperti ini. Tentu bagi saya pemerintah daerah, Kementerian Kehutanan, ya kami semua harus menertibkan itu. Saya sudah menerima bahwa itu tidak benar dan harus kami atasi. I understand, Mr. President. All due respect. I understand. Ya terima kasih, tapi saya belum puas sampai pada tingkat yang Indonesia betul-betul. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. But as I leave, I wonder if there's just too much pressure to develop the forests for anything to change. Here's a good one. Yeah, this is a really good one. But there's got to be some. Diana's six and her assistant, Ryan Bracewell, have been hiking through these Montana forests for the past 16 years down a trail of a killer. Oh, there's one. You got one? Let me get my forceps. Looks wow. like a mountain pine beetle to me. Sure does. Look at that. Look at that, first beetle of the season. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe something that little kills so many trees, huh? Fire gets all the attention right now because, you know, it's very flashy. It, it also threatens people's homes. People get really nervous about fires. Beetles are sort of like a slower fire. There's another live one. But when you have something like 45 million acres of trees killed, it's absolutely astonishing to me that it hasn't captured more attention. A beetle will land on a tree and then they'll release a chemical and any other mountain pine beetle that's around will be attracted in. And so if that beetle attracts in hundreds or maybe even thousands of beetles, they can kill the tree. So I see a bunch of trees with yellow foliage on them. There's probably a bunch of beetles in them. Evergreens aren't supposed to change color. These trees are red because they're infested and dying. The yellow trees have only just been attacked, but the gray ones are already dead. I started working on bark beetles about 20 years ago. In those days, they pretty much played by the book. If you wanted to get some adult beetles, you went out two weeks in mid-July, that's when they attacked trees. And if I missed that window, I was, that was it for a year, I had to wait. These days, uh, everything has changed. Freezing winter temperatures used to kill the beetles. But now with longer summers, they can reproduce twice in a single season. And they are infesting whole new sections of North America. The beetles have moved hundreds of kilometers further north. And the only thing that'll allow that, of course, is it's now warm enough for them to make a living there. And that wasn't the case in the past. The destruction is nothing short of staggering. Bark beetles have killed more trees than all fires combined over the past 10 years in the US and Canada. I have to admit, when I was working on beetles in the earlier days, I wasn't on board with climate change. But after a while, it, you couldn't miss the changes. And gradually, you know, I ended up working on climate change because I didn't have any other option. And the death of all these trees, from beetles and fires, is setting off a vicious cycle. All the carbon released by the dead trees will speed up the rate of climate change which would only lead to higher temperatures, more beetles, and more fires. Wildfires in the United States burned 4 million acres in 2013. They destroyed 2,000 structures and caused nearly a billion dollars worth of damage. The Forest Service spent over a billion dollars fighting fires. And for the seventh time in the past 12 seasons, they ran out of money, forcing them to siphon from other programs to pay the bills. Just another year, in the new normal of our fire seasons. How much of our forest can we lose in the last 20 years or so? We've lost from a combination of bark beetle outbreaks and forest fires, you know, 20 to 30% here in the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico. 
So if this continues for the next 20, 30, 50 years, we probably could lose 50% of our forests. I mean, that's, that's, that's probably a realistic, you know, guess uh, where, where we're headed. And what kind of a landscape will it be when we lose that, that much of our forest cover? It's hard for me to imagine half of the trees in the American West gone in the next few decades. And it is scarier still to realize that the more trees we lose, the more global warming will accelerate. I'm back in California. I'm about to see where palm oil ends up after it leaves Indonesia. This factory is run by a company called Unilever, which uses more palm oil than any other manufacturer in the world. So Gavin, I understand you're retired now, but you were the chief sustainability officer of Unilever? That's right. I mean, how much palm oil does uh, Unilever buy in a year? We buy about 1.5 million tons, which represents 3% of what's produced globally. It's used in both our food products and our home and personal care products, things like shampoos and soaps and body lotions and that kind of thing. Unilever makes dozens of all-American brands, from Dove soap to Ben & Jerry's ice cream. For years, the company was also a major accomplice to deforestation. But then it made an about-face and pledged to stop buying palm oil from companies that are actively destroying forests. When did that policy become a real active ingredient in your corporate plan? There's no doubt about it that the um, attack that Greenpeace made on us in 2008 catalyzed action inside the company. I saw these people climbing the building, and I hadn't a clue what it was. By accident, I happened to be the most senior person in the building that day. And so I had to go down and talk to the Greenpeace guys down there. It was quite a life-changing moment. We changed very fundamentally. Just a month later, the CEO at the time made this public commitment about sourcing all of the palm oil sustainably by 2015. But how can Unilever know that all its palm oil is OK? When I was in Tessanilo National Park, I learned that some of the biggest suppliers, including a giant company called Wilmar, were buying and selling from illegal plantations. We've been to Indonesia and we've been to Tessanilo right now. It's being redeveloped uh, illegally, I must say, it, as uh, palm oil plantations. The nearest mill to Tessanilo is a Wilmar mill. Unilever buys palm oil from Wilmar. That is true. And Wilmar has refused to take the responsibility for policing its supply chain. And yet Unilever continues to buy from Wilmar. So in the palm oil industry, it's difficult to avoid Wilmar. They are vast, they are huge. But I think you'll find that Wilmar is a business in transition. It has a huge distance to travel, but it's really important that it reaches its destination because without Wilmar, we won't solve the deforestation issue. How can we know that, that you're sincere in your efforts and that it's not just some public relations campaign of Unilever to look good to its consumers? I don't know the answer to that question. I really don't know because this is, this is tricky. We can't provide reassurance on all of these things. This is very much not just about an individual company, call it Unilever or another company. This is about trying to transform the whole market. And it's really important that we do that. Because if these forests go, then it's a sad lookout for all humanity. The lookout just got a bit brighter. After this conversation, Wilmar announced it would not buy palm oil from recently deforested land. So far, these are just words, but at least they're good words. 
The forestry minister also made good on his pledge to protect half of that peat forest. You are willing to sign that, yeah. the paper. Yeah. 50%. And recently, the director of Tessanillo National Park was fired. Some of the illegal plantations were raided by police, and three signed an agreement to leave the park. It's not nearly enough, but it's proof that things can change. Extinction is happening, and we are watching. People need to see what's gone wrong, and they have to be exposed to the mechanisms that can help make it right. You've got to bring to people's hearts and minds an understanding of what's going on out there and the rate of change, or it's all going to be gone. And we'll have no place to live. Our kids will have no place to live.